The primary goal of wetland interviews is to share lessons learned, challenges, and experiences in wetland research and conservation. As a diverse community of wetland scientists, it is imperative that we increase and further promote the information and knowledge exchange that currently exists between individuals and between countries. To facilitate the knowledge exchange of wetland science, we interview researchers and practitioners worldwide. Through this effort, we also incorporate a wetland legend series holding interviews with distinguished and prominent wetland researchers and practitioners. Today, we're going to be interviewing Dr. Douglas Wilcox. I'd like to give you some brief background about Dr. Wilcox before we start with our questions and answers. Dr. Wilcox is a wetland ecologist who retired from the U.S. Geological Survey in 2008 to accept the position at Brockport in his native Western New York State. He had also recently retired from his role as editor-in-chief of the scientific journal Wetlands after 20-year tenure. His research on wetlands has spanned Great Lakes Basin and focused primarily on interactions of wetland plant communities in hydrology, including the role of climate change and the effects of lake-level regulation. He was a major contributor in the International Joint Commission study on regulation of Lake Ontario, St. Lawrence River levels and flows. He is also the Lake Ontario Eastern Lake Erie lead on large study funded by the U.S. EPA that initiated a wetland monitoring program for all Great Lakes wetlands. His current research focus is on developing wetland restoration methodologies for use in Lake Ontario wetlands and implementing them in the field. He is now finishing his second year of planned phase retirement. Welcome, Dr. Wilcox. How are you today? And thank you for your time. I'm doing just fine. So I have some questions I'd like to answer that uh, more or less are scripted, but I suggest we take the conversation or the interview in a direction where your responses may dictate us to or guide us to rather. So my questions just may serve as talking points. So my first question is, when or how did you decide that you would be a scientist and can you recall at what age you realized your interview, your interest rather to pursue science? And our, our limit on this uh, call is gonna be 30 minutes or probably about 28 minutes at this point. So just to, to recap, I was interested in when you decided to become a scientist and can you recall at what interest, what age your interest to pursue science first occurred? When I was in fifth grade, the US and USSR were in the midst of the space race. And I knew then that I was going to be a scientist, just not what kind. That was probably about age 10 or 11. And science is a discipline, but how about when you decided to pursue wetland studies? When did that actually happen? Well, most people that are in wetland science now um, were not trained as wetland scientists. I got my BS and MS degrees in biochemistry but took all the water-related courses I could find. In my first real research position with the National Park Service at Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore, I began doing research on degraded wetlands. I also completed a PhD while I was there. When I went to my first SWS meeting in St. Paul, Minnesota in 1983, I realized that wetland science had become a profession that I was a wetland scientist. That's very interesting. So part of what we're looking to do with this interview with questions and answers is perhaps give inspiration to those that are contemplating going into wetland science. So your background and describing your background is useful in responses and, and maybe inspiring a number of people to have an interest in wetland scientists because of how important it's become. Well, Were there any significant breaks? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Were there any significant breaks or opportunities that made a difference in establishing your career? And conversely, were there any failures or disappointments that you could tell us about that confronted you that influenced the direction of your career? Well, my first break was in getting a research position at Indiana Dunes where opportunities for studies were right outside the door. And I was given a free hand to talk to take on the research that I saw as valuable. My second break was in working out a way to complete a PhD while in that job. It lifted the glass ceiling on my career. 
My third break came in moving on to what is now the U.S. Geological Survey Great Lakes Science Center, where I was given the opportunity to study wetlands across the entire Great Lakes, something that nobody else was doing at that time. My next big break was being offered a State University of New York College of Brockport endowed faculty position at Brockport in my native Western New, Western New York State and 15 miles from some of my Lake Ontario research sites. So I took my federal retirement and went into academia with the goal of helping to train the next generation of wetland scientists. My only regrets are that I, I did not get started on this venture earlier and the age is telling me that I need to retire. That's very interesting. So you grew up in the area where you're now teaching in New York State? <clears throat> uh, about two hours away, yes. So perhaps when you were younger, because you said at what young age you began to have an interest in science, I'm going to assume you could tell us whether or not your environment that you grew up in helped stimulate your interest for the natural sciences because of where you lived in terms of ecosystems, et cetera. Well, when I was a kid, I grew up as a muskrat trapper. So I was in wetlands from the time I was probably 12 or 13 years old. And I spent half of my time, my free time with hip boots on. When I went deer hunting, I wore hip boots so I, so I could go anywhere I wanted to go. Um, so I was in the field a lot in growing up in a rural, rural area with nature right outside my door. I was tied to nature from an early age. Understandable. You had response to my question about any challenges that you might have had. It, it sounded like you didn't have any kind of significant negative occurrences along your career development path. Wasn't there any challenges when you were working your PhD that were maybe um, giving you more of a, some, some stress and, than otherwise? Or what I'm looking to see is whether or not there was any outstanding challenges that you had overcome during your either your academic career or when you were talking about your working career. So I'm looking for some stories that you might be able to relate or share with us that others could benefit from in terms of things that we need to overcome that could be challenges that turned into opportunities. And from what I heard and, and what you explained to us, it sounded like everything went, went well and there was, there was nothing, was a, ne a major negative that occurred. Is, is that correct? Or do you have things that you could share with us that would be examples of challenges that you needed to overcome? Well, there are always challenges a lot of it has to do with your desire to get over them. <clears throat> when I was began working at Indiana Dunes long ago uh, as a re, uh, training exercise, I took an aquatic plants course. I realized this was with a background in biochemistry and doing a lot of water chemistry work. But I took a, um, a graduate course at Michigan State's on Kellogg Bio Biological Station as a training course. It was offered on, on Wednesdays and, and Saturdays all day long for six weeks. It's being taught by Jim Grace, who had just finished his PhD with Bob Wetzel. And <clears throat> we would go to the field every day. And one, it was a two hour drive and an hour time difference. So it started at eight o'clock and I had to get up at five o'clock and leave at five o'clock in the morning to be there. That was a challenge, but I was really psyched to do so. And we would go in the field in the morning. I'm sorry, we would, in the morning, he would lecture about aquatic plants. Then we would go to the field, do a lot of collection, bring them back to the lab and identify them. And I had been working on a water chemistry related problem with road salt contamination of Pinhook Bog, which was in, in, in the park at Indiana Dunes. And the road salt contamination was killing all the wetland plants, but I didn't know any, I didn't know what they were. <clears throat> um, 
taking the training class or the course as training, I, uh, we were required to have 60 plants, identified plants. I would go back to my job and collect even more. And I had 120. So I was really, really into it. But I also realized that I now knew uh, con the connection between the, the water pollution problems at Pinot Fog and the plant communities, the, this plant species that are being killed. I had a couple publications from earlier research and I would get a reprint request in postcards that were addressed to Dr. Douglas Wilcox. And I liked the sound of that. And I realized that with being able to tie the vegetation and water chemistry uh, issues together, I might have the makings of a PhD. So I farmed the idea out to Dr. Ann Spacey at Purdue University who was interested in, in it and took me on as a graduate student. Uh, I started in, in August there and uh, 23 months later, I defended. I, my challenges there were, it was the first time in my uh, academic career that I ever paid tuition, but I was also working full time so I could afford it. The other issue and challenge was that it was a 90 uh, mile drive, an hour, over an hour and a half drive to go there uh, to do my coursework. So I took classes on Tuesdays and courses that were offered on Tuesday and Thursday and drove down there back and forth and did this for two semesters and got all my coursework done. Um, so I, it was quite a challenge finishing it all, but I, I got the PhD in it, in it uh, removed the glass ceiling for my career. So I want to go back to something you said earlier. I also want to reflect on the story that you just shared with us. And uh, let's start with potential advice you could offer to somebody that is anticipating going to graduate school after they finish their bachelor's degree. So that's one thought. And I also want to turn back to what you said a little while ago about how your academic career is something that you enjoyed very much. And you, I believe you said you wish you had started that sooner. So the, those are just two separate issues I want to take a look at. Perhaps we should start with um, the latter where you were saying you would wish you had gone into teaching earlier and then come back to this idea about offering advice to people that are contemplating going to graduate schools and pursuing a PhD. Well, let's start with the latter one. When I suggested getting started earlier, I had some other jobs before I started in Indiana Dunes that gave me some background, but they were really not in the field that I wanted to be in. And the advice, going back to the first question, the advice that I give to students, both undergraduates and graduates, is that they need to explore a career in which they can't wait to go to work on Monday. They need to find a job doing what they would do if they were millionaires and did not need to get paid. If they can find that kind of a job, they'll be successful. Somehow I managed to do it via a circuitous route, but most people never find the career path that they really desire for, the, for their entire life. So I tell students to keep their eyes open and recognize that career opportunity when it shows up. If they're looking, 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 they're probably not going to see it. It's going to pop into their heads someday. They're gonna realize people get paid for doing that. That's what I really, really wanna do. They need to find that. Uh, that is, to me, one of the most powerful things you've said so far during this interview, and I'll, I'll paraphrase, find a job you love and you'll never work a day in your life, or find something you're very passionate about, which obviously you are, and then getting up on Monday and going to work becomes a much easier thing to do. I, I'd have to believe and expect that most of us that are in wetland scientists, ecology, limnology, et cetera, we are very passionate about our studies. The trick sometimes is finding the employment opportunities that could um, help you pay for your your college loans, et cetera, and be able to make a viable living from that. So unfortunately, jobs in science today don't offer these um, 
elaborate incomes that you might find in other disciplines. But going back to what you said, if finding something that you're passionate about or a job that you love makes it getting up every day to do that job much easier. Okay, so you've done, you've given me some great information about your your uh, career, which we appreciate. Just wondering if you had any particular moments that were of noteworthiness or an aha moment that you had where you discovered something about your work that was particularly interesting or perhaps some moment where you had been dealing with something that was frustrating then finally overcame and got to some, some answers. That's a rather open-ended question, so I'll let you respond to that any way possible. And again, just to paraphrase briefly, looking for something that you worked on for a period of time and then overcame something with your discovery and uh, overcame frustrations in developing that work that, that, that might have given you those frustrations. Did, did that question make sense? Well, it's a long question, but I can cover parts of that. <clears throat> my, aha okay. moment, my aha moments come when I'm in the field or when I'm writing a manuscript and the clouds just part and pass away and my mind sees how nature works. And those are thrilling moments. I've had a lot of them. They're what keeps me going. As an example, I was working on a manuscript from some work I was when I was in with the Park Service and a study I did at Voyageurs National Park where the plant communities uh, in the regulated lakes there were doing very strange things. I could not figure out how a couple of very small mat forming plants were out competing very large plants. And I was reading them, I'd done a lot of, uh, of journal manuscript reading or journal article reading. I have a, a collection of about 10,000 journal reprints, all of them keyworded, and entered into a computer program so I could pull out the, the citations that I need when I'm working on manuscript. But I was reading a paper from a uh, researcher working on, on hydropower reservoirs in Sweden, and it described these two plant, map forming plant species and why they were dominant there. And I realized that those were exactly the, the reasons they were growing in my Voyager study site. That was an aha moment, and I remember it very, very clearly. Excellent. We had some technical issues prior to getting on this call successfully, so I've been looking at our time. I think, I hope, we have about five minutes late, if I'm correcting my, my timekeeping. And I, I wanted you looking to our, our global future together as scientists and practitioners. And there seems to be an advent, at least in the press lately, in the media about climate change. And of course, we know how wetlands play a pivotal role in what, uh, what those ecosystems do for our global ecology. So my, my question would be, what role do you see wetland practitioners playing and how can we assist with these issues, whether it's education, research, or problem solving, or the future of climate change, potential climate change? So I know that's a vague or open-ended question, but I'm looking for perspective on the future and how wetlands and wetland scientists may help work successfully with climate change, et cetera, and how we can balance what's happening with our ecology and how what we benefit us and what, what role, what in time, what in practitioners will play. Well, that is a large question. The, our climate change obviously is, is real and 99% of scientists agree with that, the ones that are not getting paid to say something else. From a wetland perspective, it is a wetland, and climate change largely will result in changes in hydrology and in precipitation patterns and evaporation patterns. And many wetland scientists do not get into hydrology all that much. And the real key for me in understanding climate change effect on wetlands is to uh, understand the relationship of changing hydrology to changing wetland 
habitats and wild and plant communities. So I would encourage well and scientists <clears throat> to, if they're not, if they don't have a hydrology background, hook up with somebody that does and work together to, com to combine wetland hydrology and wetland ecology to understand climate change and get the work published so that people see it and can back up uh, claims that wetland are being affected by climate change. My last question, because I think we're running, running uh, out of our scheduled time here, is reflecting on what I've read, I would say that, or what I know, that 50% of the wetlands worldwide have been destroyed. So how do you envision Earth's future and that large hurdle that we must try to overcome, how critical the role is for wetlands and the fact that 50% of the wetlands worldwide have been destroyed? What, what kind of challenges do you envision if we're looking to restore wetlands globally Given our past history and, and what we're, what you and I and the future generations will be dealing with, so I'm looking for you to comment on what unique challenges there may be because of the extent of destroyed wetlands that we've had globally so far. Well, the first challenge is related to politics, and people need to be involved in politics because politicians are going to decide whether regulations are are in place or or followed to protect wetlands. The other thing is wetland restoration. In the restoration is a continuing practice. It's a young field of science like wetland science is, and people don't know how everything works or don't have a good feel for it. So there needs to be research on how to do restorations. You do them properly before enacting the actual restorations and then there need to be follow-up with long-term monitoring of, of restoration results so we can see what works and what doesn't work and do it properly in the future. You, you, you covered the issue of hydrology and how it relates to wetlands. I'm, I'm thinking now about mitigation, restoration, creation and just Perhaps you can comment your thoughts on those three different perspectives or those three different opportunities, because if there's existing hydrology, it makes it better to do a wetland res res restoration. So what I'm what I'm looking for you to comment on is any in the event of looking to do a wetland creation and how pivotal, how important the hydrology is in order to create a wetland where there wasn't one versus doing a restoration or mitigation. Wetland creation is a even more difficult problem because most wetlands formed over thousands of years. And you can create a wetland, but it, it'd be very difficult to ever have it be what, if you're creating a wetland in mitigation for having a wetland destroyed, uh, it's probably not going to be anything near what was, was originally there. So, that's a tough question. Sure, and I have one more follow-up question, and that is re regarding what we sh we should attempt to do for the future. And so, the, my answer to that is we shouldn't we shouldn't destroy any more wetlands because to create them and mitigate them is quite costly. So, the future success of what we might try to do for climate change wetlands play a critical role. And how do you see this idea or the concept you talked about politics? So the politics of making sure that we don't have any more wetland destructions based on land development, land use, et cetera. Do you have any thoughts about that that you could share with us briefly? And I'm not sure if I framed that out clearly, but just to paraphrase a little bit, looking for a comment about how we should engage in preservation and try to reduce land development at this point. Well, as wetland scientists, the important thing to do is get our work published in showing the results of wetland uh, degradation and the loss of wetlands in the impacts that it's had on, uh, on people's lives, things that people, most people don't even recognize. 
the other issue is to, if you want to make, if you want politicians to pay attention to the science that's being produced, it needs to be published in peer-reviewed journals so that um, the politicians that are on your side can have something to back up what they're saying. And those that are trying to, to destroy wetlands have something they have to overcome and, and that there's been good um, science published in journals. I appreciate that very much. And I've actually learned a lot from this interview today. We have all, only a minute left, I believe. I'm looking at my timekeeping here. Is there any other thing that you'd like to reflect on or comment on based on what we're trying to accomplish with this wetland interview series? Anything, any final thought? I'd like to just give you that opportunity. I'm not asking a question, but do you have any final thoughts about what we discussed and what we're trying to accomplish with this uh, wetland series interviewing well, effort that we're currently working on? Well, as you may know, I've put together an edited book called what Legends of Wetland Science. And it's the stories from a lot of different famous wetland scientists telling how they got into science, how they got into wetland science, and covering some of the same questions that you asked me. I served as editor-in-chief of the journal Wetlands for 20 years, and that gave me an opportunity to meet a lot of really great folks. Those are the, the legends of wetland science that I invited as, as uh, chapter presenters in my book. Excellent. So I would encourage all of our listeners to get a copy of that book. But I want to thank you very much for your time and your indulgence. I believe this is the first interview of the Wetland Legend series that we're doing in the United States. So thank you for being part of that experiment and sharing your personal experiences with us. I'm sure it'll be a value to listeners. It certainly was a benefit to me uh, listening to your responses today and my questions. So thank you for your time and patience. And we have a, a moderator that's with us, Tatiana. So I want to turn this back over to you. I don't know if you could join the call or you're just going to end it. Hi, Roy. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I appreciate uh, uh, this very uh, interesting interview. And uh, I would like to invite uh, all of you um, to join the next uh, Wetlands interviews and be um, in the uh, SWS webinars also. And thank you, Roy. And thank you, Douglas. Thank you. It's been my okay, pleasure. thank you both very much. Take care.